you know what we're doing is we're moving into the application phase of the class. You've already gone through the homeworks, you've gone through the problems. The first part of the, the first exam because is the hardest. It's the hardest one. This one's pretty hard, but that was a lot of work. Okay. Obviously, the mathematics is really easy because they gave you the answers, but the first part of the exam was really hard. But you need to study and memorize the, the content. So you basically memorize the and learn the foundations of financial economics that then you can move forward and start doing more applications. It's one thing to do problems in the homework and do problems in the uh, problem set because they're just discrete problems. There's no context to them, okay? Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna work on real life applications, real life problems, okay? So basically the midterm is broken up into case studies. First one, we're gonna pretend like we're a venture capital or a private equity firm and we're gonna buy a startup company, okay? And the second question is we're gonna do, we're gonna be the investment banker, okay? And we're gonna uh, evaluate and value a established tech company. And then the third case study is gonna be a stock valuation. We're gonna value uh, a stable company like IBM or Intel. Uh, the next one we're going to value a real estate investment trust, which is a real estate security, a uh, real estate stock. Then the next one we're going to do a real estate development. This is modeled after Salesforce Tower in downtown San Francisco. Does anybody not know Salesforce Tower in downtown San Francisco? Anybody not know what it is? You know what it is? Yeah. Okay. So that's what that one's modeled about. Then the next uh, one is uh, on page six is a uh, piece of real estate modeled after Mission Bay. Do you guys know Mission Bay? University of San Francisco, Genentech, Biotech, Medical Office, multi-billion dollar uh, real estate project, mixed use by Alexandria, uh, anchored by UCSF. It's one of the more, most premier mixed use medical tech oriented campuses state-of-the-art in the world, okay, in San Francisco. And then the last, page seven, I'm going to go through a little bit of this today when I do the first case study, which is the development of the investment decision-making matrix. Uh, we would have been exposed to this if the capital budgeting presentation had been done on Thursday. We would, would have gone through this, so I'm going to have to do some of this for you. So if you have any questions or if you have any issues and the logic or the content, um, let me know, okay? Um, and, I'll, and I'll slow it down, all right? Okay. So this is, this, is, this is like the Harvard method. Anybody heard of Harvard Business School, MBA program, all case studies? You do case studies there. Okay. Once you've learned the material, they assume you only know it because you, you know, graduated with a business degree came into their MBA program and it's basically a boot camp style case study program that grinds people through. And if you've gone through their grinded through Harvard, it's probably that next to Wharton and MIT are probably the top schools, but Harvard is basically the top brand because everybody knows that if you went through Harvard, you just got grinded through the program. Okay. So let's do the, the first case study. And then somebody's going to need to time me so that I, I stay on track. So the first one is a venture capital and a private equity case study. Do you know what venture capital? Do you know what a venture capital firm is and what it does in a private equity firm? Do you know the difference between the two? What? Perfect. No. So venture capital firms, which the majority are located on Sand Hill Drive in Palo Alto, next to Stanford University. Basically, those guys raise on a quarterly basis $20 billion a quarter. $20 billion in Northern California. $20 billion of the $40 billion raised in the United States per quarter goes to Silicon Valley. Half, half of it. And if you add in San Diego and LA and Seattle, Portland, and those, the West basically dominates the venture capital space. We probably, between the Pacific Northwest and California, we probably capture between 70 and 
80% all venture capital raised in the United States per quarter. Okay, so where's the opportunity? Tech startups and venture capital. Venture capitalists are basically motivated by tech companies uh, that have gone through at least a year or two of initial growth phases, a couple rounds of financing, bootstrapped by their founders, um, and then what they'll do is they will uh, fund the company, usually between 25 and $50 million will be injected into the company, and they will come in and they will implement their systems and implement and bring in talent that have basically taken companies from initial phases and initial stages, grow them, and take them public, or sell the company to a private equity firm or a large public company as an exit strategy, okay? And that's basically what we're doing, okay? <clears throat> the private equity firms are a little bit different, too. Uh, private equity firms, unlike the venture capital firms, buy firms and keep them in their portfolio of companies um, that they basically own and manage. Venture capital firms do keep some, but they usually spin them out or sell them off to get an exit, the capital line from their strategies. Private equity usually holds the firms um, in their portfolio. And if it does make strategic sense to exit through a sale, strategic sale in most cases, they will sell the firm, but most of them are buy and hold strategies. Okay? As we know, there are four main valuation methods. For this case study, we are going to use earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, or EBITDA, uh, which is going to be our free cash flow metric. For the tar valuing the target company. Following are the assumptions. We're going to use four valuation methodologies. We're going to use perpetuity, or growth, multiple approach, and discounted cash flow. And as you can see right there, we've also been provided multiples, okay, of transactions that we've heard about, or transactions that have occurred within the last six to nine months that we've done ourselves. So these are the multiples. So the value of the firm, or the sales price of the firm, divided by the annual uh, EBITDA, usually projected, is gonna give us a multiple, that we're gonna multipl multiply to the projected cash flow to get the intrinsic value using the multiple approach. And then we're gonna use discounted cash flow. The type of firm that we're looking to acquire is a small tech startup in the software consumer product space, and actually, I think the firm that we're looking at that could go global very easily uh, once we acquire them and bring in our systems and our own talent is being uh, bought by a private equity or a venture capital firm, which is us. Also show the calculations for the valuations utilizing the above methods. So all right here, as you can see right here, right here, see this right here? This data right here, there's the data. That's all we need right there to be able to value the firm using the four methodologies, okay? So using the perpetuity Gordon growth multiple approach, what is the intrinsic value of the target company? Using discounted cash flow, what is the present value, net present value, internal rate of return, and break even? So we'll get to those. Would you accept or reject this project or this acquisition? If the net present value is negative, what four iterations would you go for? go through investment iterations would you go through if you still could not get the pr project net present value positive what would be your last scenario and what would be the net net present value okay so there's a lot here okay just on this one page all right so let's start the valuation process what's the first valuation methodology and I, oh, does anybody need any uh, calculators you might want to pull up your calculator because I do if, you're, if this was an investment committee meeting and you were the underwriters in the investment committee meeting, would you have your computer with you? No? Calculator? Computer? Yeah. yeah. Do you have that stuff? Do you have a calculator? Do you have calculators? I'm sorry. Am I? I'm just going to have to move it in. Anybody else? Need a calculator? Else. You're going to be doing the calculations because what happens in these 
meetings, and this doesn't matter if it's marketing or finance, the uh, people who are running the meeting are looking to you for input. They're going to be asking you questions. Okay. They're going to be expecting you to, be, to check and double check the numbers and run these numbers. Okay, so I need you to check and double check the numbers and you are really engaged. I need you to, to basically do the, do the calculations. So what's the first valuation methodology? It's perpetuity. Okay. Okay, so what do we need to calculate the intrinsic value using the perpetuity? Approach? Now you can use your notes. I think uh, I don't know if you gave me your. You gave me your uh, packet. You can take your packet back and you can use the notes. But what's the perpetuity model? How do we calculate the intrinsic value using the perpetuity model? Cash flow. Yeah, what cash flow are we using? Are we using last year, this year, or next year? Next year. What's your? Next year. Next year. Okay. And we divide that by what? Discount rate. Discount rate, or it could also be the. Yeah, the expected return. Excellent. Got it. So we do, do we know the cash flow for next year? Do we know what the cash flow is for next year? Now this is the hard part of learning. It's like you're, you're struggling. You're trying to think through the process. I need you to try to think through the process and not just wait for me to provide the answers to write on the board to memorize to regurgitate in the in the uh, exam, I need you to start thinking now we're about you know, a third of the way through the course and I think I've trained you enough to start thinking creatively. Okay? So how do I get next year's uh, free cash flow or even done? Well, you're going to have to be And it's all right here on the <coughs> exam. So if you study this, you'll probably be able to figure it out. Well, I think you're going to have the, the, the zero year cash flow. Yeah, I do have the zero year cash flow. So what's that? Well, they want to keep with zero. So you can keep so what's the zero year cash flow? 20 million. 20 million, got it. Okay, so what do I need to do to get next year's cash flow? Well, you have the C plus one on the time period here, so we're going to the first year, but of course. It's how much? 40%. 40%. So yeah. what, do I, what do I do to the 20 million to get the first year cash flow? Well, what do I do? Come on. Come on. You can do it. I'm going to push you guys. Do I divide or multiply? Yeah, and what's the growth rate? Okay, let's try that again. What's the growth rate? What growth rate are we going to use? Uh, I could use that one, but I'm probably going to use that for uh, board and growth. Did, did they give you any pro forma cash flow projections? Yeah. 40%. 40% for the first year. And then what do I multiply the 20 million by? Four foot. Got it. Four. And that's going to give me what? What's 20 million times 1.4? Calculators. What is it? 28 million. Okay. Is that correct? No? Yes? I'm in the meeting. I get one person that yells out the answer. I find out 15 minutes into the presentation that he made a mistake, and we all look like idiots basically in front of the board. Okay. So I need validation and verification. Is that correct? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so what's the first uh, first year, next year's cash flow? 28 million, excellent. Okay, and then what do we do to get the value using the perpetuity approach? Excellent. And what's the expected return? So what's 28 million divided by 0.3? Are you doing anything in your head? You want to borrow a calculator? Okay. What is it? I can just round up. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Uh, what's the next intrinsic valuation? Year, last year, 
last year's. Next year. Next year. Over to Island G. Over to Island G. Got it. Got it. And then what's the next year's cash flow? What's next year's cash flow? What is it? 28. Yeah, I'm just testing everybody to see if they're following along. Okay. Just trying to gauge engagement. And then what do I do with that? Divide by the expected return. Divide by the expected return, which is what? Uh, 0 0.3. 0 0.3. Okay. And then what do I do? Subtract 0.3 from the cash flow growth rate. Yeah, by which one? By which one? Subtract 0.3, 0.3 minus 0.15. Yep, you got it. 0.15. Excellent. Nice job. And what is 0.3 minus 0.15? Give us 0.15. And what is 28 million divided by 0.15? 187 million. Got it. Okay, see, not too bad. Not too hard. Uh, what's the next methodology? Second, yeah. Uh, cash flow. Last year, this year, or next year's? Next year's. And what do we do? We just got to go over this stuff over and over and over and over. Find the multiple. Yeah. Times the multiple. Are we going to use this year, last year's, next year's, or, or maybe some comparable multiples? Got it. That's going to give us the values. Do we have next year's cash flow? Yeah, what is it? 28 million. Okay. And supposedly we did some deals last year, multiple multiples. What were those multiples that we did the deals at? 22, 44, and 55. Yeah. And usually what I do is I go, I do the 55 first. So what's 50, 55 times 28? Companies buy tech companies, venture capital and uh, private equity firms buy tech companies for $1.5 billion? No? What's it called? Uh, unicorns. There have been multiple transactions that have occurred. One of my students came into my office the other day and said, A friend of mine uh, recently, she got five master's degrees at Stanford University engineering and computer science. Five master's degrees in computer science <coughs> and engineering from Stanford. She sold her company for over a billion dollars. Okay. So it happens. Okay. So what's 28 million times 44? What is it? Twelve thirty million, or one point two three billion. Got it. And then what's twenty eight times twenty two? What is it? Six hundred sixteen. Six sixteen. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And if I was going to present this valuation to the investment committee, which one would I choose? Best case, worst case. Most probable. Or midpoint. Probably midpoint would be 
be conservative. You can probably do a little bit more due diligence around the valuation process, but I probably wouldn't present them a you know, best case scenario or worst case scenario, I'd probably pick something in the middle just to be conservative. We may end up at a higher or lower multiple after we continue our due diligence, but I would pick the middle point just to be safe. So currently, just based on these methodologies, I got 1.23 billion, I got 187 million, and I got 93 million. Pretty, pretty wide range, isn't it? Okay. What's the next methodology? Okay. And we're trying to calculate the present value using DCF. So the first thing I'm going to want to know is what? before I start in the evaluation process. But what's the first thing I'm going to need to know? I mean, if we're doing DCF, what do we need to know for, right off the bat? What? What's the structure of the model? Yeah, we're going to get to that. But what do I need to know? How am I going to structure the DCF? What's the first thing I need to know to be able to start calculating the model? How many years you can grow? Exactly. What's the holding period? And now, what's the holding period? Three years. This is what I do. Set it up. Bam. You know, I need a fourth year with the terminal value. Kind of set up the structure. Really and this just reminds me that I got to calculate a fourth year in the brain back. Okay. Um, what's the next thing that we can do? I usually go right, right to the discount factors. Okay. I save the cash flows for last. So, what's the expected return? The going in expected return is 30%. So, it's what? 1.3 to the what? 1. 1.3 to the what? 2. 1.3 to the what? 3. 1.3 to the 1 is what? 3. 3. What's 1.3 squared? What is it? 1.7. Yeah, 1.7. And then what's 1.3 cubed? I just start setting up the structure. Got it. All right. So, do we know what the first year cash flow is? One million. What's the first year cash flow? Twenty-eight million. Twenty-eight million. Okay. This is year one. This is year two. Year two cash flow. Take the rate and multiply by one million. No, go ahead. Grow it out an extra year. Yeah, grow it out an extra year and by what percentage? Twenty. Got it. Twenty two percent. Nice job. One point two eight. So what's twenty eight million times one point two eight? really, you know, I don't know, if you, I was in Mexico City once and we were underwriting the 
industrial portfolio for a large institutional investor and my boss was basically had me do all the calculations. You know, just think how nervous I was. I was the only one in the room with my HP calculator doing the calculations on these types of deals. It's nice when you have multiple people in there because if you make a mistake, they can ca catch you on it. But if you're the only one in the room doing the calculations, you better not make a mistake. And you may be the only one in the room someday. So just be prepared. Okay, so how do I get, now what do I do? Do I just discount these back at the present value and that's my value? Or do I have to do another procedure? Yeah, I gotta find the terminal value. Yeah, I gotta find the terminal value. So what do I need to do? decision. Are you going to use the perpetuity model and assume that the cash flows are going to remain flat forever or are you going to use Gordon growth assuming that the cash flows are going to grow at a constant rate forever? So what are we going to do? Are we going to use perpetuity and assume that cash flows are going to remain flat forever or should we assume that the cash flows are going to grow at a constant rate forever? Constant Y. Why would we use a constant growth, growth rate as opposed to perpetuity? Uh, there's that, but what are we underwriting? What are we underwriting? What are we valuing? What's the type, what's the investment that we're underwriting? Startup. It's a startup company. Do you think the startup company's cash flows are gonna remain flat after year four in the future? they're probably going to do what? Well, Grow at a constant rate. Because we're not going to buy a, we're not going to buy a company whose, uh, whose cash flow is going to remain flat forever. Okay, we're in it for the money, right? We want to buy a company that has significant value. So if we use the Gordon growth model, what are the assumptions that we use? Growth rate is constant. Uh, yes, good growth rate, based on the assumptions. So we have to, determine what the discount rate and what the growth rate is. Are we using going in or terminal? Going in. Well, we already used those to go in. Where are we now? Are we calculating the going in or the terminal? Terminal. terminal. Okay. So what's the terminal discount rate? 40%. 40%. Okay. And what's our growth rate that we're going to use? 10%. Here's a test question, test question. Why would we use a higher expected return than on the terminal than the going in? Why would we use a higher discount rate, a higher expected return for the terminal discount rate than the going in? Because you're growing it out for the company expected returns. Yeah, that, that's theoretically correct. But I'm looking for something a little bit more can you, can you predict with 100% certainty what the cash flows are going to grow, grow at or what the company is going to be like from year four for the next 10, 20 years? No. What kind of company is this? It's a startup company. Are those types of company, companies highly risky? Yeah. Yeah, so wouldn't you want to use a higher discount rate? Also, can you do these tech companies? Uh, are they subjected to intense competition? Absolutely, so you want to use higher discount rate. And do these tech companies utilize uh, technologies that are uh, that can become obsolete very quickly? Absolutely. Okay, so you have to take in the competitive pressure and the risk and you use a higher discount rate to compensate for that higher risk. What about the growth rate? What was the going in growth rate? 15%, we use 10%. Why are we using a lower Growth rate assumption. It's not inflated. Uh, it inflates value. Why would I use this, uh, a slower growth rate? Is it like a conservative strategy just in case the company slows down in the future? Well, the, the, theoretically, that's correct. The, 
The companies are going to slow in the future, but it's the same assumptions for the discount rate. Is the company going to be under intense competition? Yeah. And as it is bombarded by competition, isn't its cash flow going to slow? Yeah. And as it get, gets bigger, doesn't the cash flow start to slow? Yeah. Did you have a question? No. Okay. So that's what we did. So what's 52 million divided by 0.3? Take the 173 million and I add the 45 million. What do I get? Start taking points back from the back of the exam. Come on, you gotta start thinking. Divide by two point two. Got it. So you divide it by the two point two. So what's two eighteen divided by two point two? Ninety nine billion. Ninety nine billion or million? Billion. Six million divided by one point seven. Six point one million. A million. Got it. And then what do we do next? Twenty eight million divided by one point three. Got it. And it's twenty eight uh, divided by one point three. Twenty two million. What do, we, what do we do next? Add them up. Add them up. What do we get? So which one will we use? What do we use to get the intrinsic value? DCF. Okay, I got one DCF, DCF. two DCF. Anybody else? Any other analysts? Got to crank your brain. Just, uh, what do you think? That's what they're going to ask you. What do you think? And you're going to have to answer them. Either it's going to be, I don't know or you're going to give them the answer. So I got two people, this is called group think, where you have two people basically decide the group's fate. Okay, I wouldn't do it. I would give your own opinion even though you're wrong. Do not let other people um, basically determine your fate because they could be taking you down a rabbit hole and you may not come back. Okay, you have to think on your own. So what do you think? Which one's the, the most appropriate methodology to value the firm? DCF in this case, because it incorporates the board growth and the perpetuity. Okay, anybody else? This is a real life case study. Anybody else? I, I think the exact word like it. We would be the most appropriate committee to incorporate the head on. Okay. These are actual deals that went down in the marketplace. There's actual firms out there, our firm and the other firms that actually paid 55, 45, and 22 times earnings for companies. These are actual transactions. These are not theoretical exercises in finance. These are actual deals and transactions that were conducted in the marketplace. So do you use the theoretical models or do you use the actual transactions? We use the actual transactions. 
So even though these are nice, theoretically, and probably give you a worst case scenario, if we buy this company and we go in, and we turn it around and help it expand and grow, which I think it can, we should be able to increase the value of the firm to become a $1.23 billion firm. We can either keep it, spin it out, or we can sell it to somebody else at that time. So really the multiple approach is the most appropriate approach. So if we were to calculate the net present value, what would be the net present value for this? What would be the net present value? What's the value? What's the valuation? What's the value? accept or reject this acquisition. other than the multiple approach. So we have 142 million here, 42, 187, and I got 93. The board asks you, the investment committee asks you, based on those three methodologies, or a blend of them, what would be your estimated intrinsic value for this firm? It's a real life question. Three methodologies. What value, intrinsic value, should we come up with? What do you think? What? You could. I mean, which ones? Wh which two are probably the most accurate? Which one's the least accurate? Perpetuity, because it assumes what? Yeah, the, the cash flows are going to remain flat forever. So I'd probably throw this on. So now I'm stuck with two. Now how do I reconcile those two? <clears throat> what could be my approach? I could do a weighted average, or I could just do a... You gotta come up with a value. The chair of the investment committee is asking you, what do you think? What value should you come up with? To reconcile those two approaches. You could just use the average if you want to, or you could use a weighted average. But you, well, let's use the average. So what's the average? exercise again. Okay. So what was the intrinsic value? What was the intrinsic value? 165 million. And what's the acquisition price? What's my net present value? Accept or reject it. So this is my first iteration. That's my first, what's called my first pass. So I go back, we go back, we're in the boardroom. 
investment committees there. And, you know, based on our research, we calculated a negative debt present value of $35 million, and we proposed to reject the, the acquisition of this company. Now, the investment committee is not going to be very happy because we've spent a lot of time identifying this company, and we need to grow our company in the future through acquisitions. So the board basically says, no, we really want this company. Go back and do what? What would be the second iteration of the second thing that you would do? Okay, this is standard business procedure. This is what we do. So the board says, no, we really want this company. We want you to go do what? We want you to do what? What could you do to get this acquisition to work? Find a straight deal. What? Find a straight deal. Uh, I think you're on to what I'm asking for. Maybe um, <coughs> explain a little bit more. Find where the company's profit going? No, no, no. What's the first thing that I could do to get this deal to work? What's the problem with the transaction right now? You got a negative MPV, yeah. which means what? The acquisition price is too high or too low? Too high. In what amount? No, it's too high in what amount? 35 million, right? So if we can reduce the acquisition as for a price reduction. <laughs> Have the 200 million in the amount of the negative MPV. Ask for a price reduction. What does our MPV turn out to be? Or what is our acquisition price? Intrinsic value? 165 million is the intrinsic value. Okay. And what's our net present value? Equal to zero. Zero. And at a zero MPV, do we accept or reject? That's the first thing we do. We go back and we see if we can get a price reduction. Now, do you, sellers always give you a price reduction in the amount of the negative net present value? No. no. So you got to go to the next iteration. And you're probably not going to get there. We still want the company. You know, we couldn't get a price reduction. So now what we need you to do is we need you to go back and do what? What do you do now? We really want this company. The board wants it, the investors want it, the investment committee wants it, the employees really want to buy that company. Now you've got to justify it. What do you need to do now as the underwriting team? What would you do now? of it, but think a little bit more aggressively. What would, what would we need to do? What did we just do over the last last half hour? Intrinsic value. We did the intrinsic value. So what would we need to do now? Rerun. Exactly. We would go back. We would go back and reevaluate. Go back and reevaluate the assumptions. And what were the assumptions that we need to go back and reevaluate? What? Yeah, yeah, let's go through them. So let's just list them. So you guys should be looking up there and then you yell at me. Uh, 
Yeah, but give me the assumptions. We're not assuming the perpetuity model? Well, we're, now we're just looking at the, the, the assumptions. We're looking at the, we're going to create sensitivities, the assumptions. We're looking now at the assumptions, which are the inputs within the models. We've got to go back and reevaluate the inputs. What are the inputs in the model? Beta of 21. What? Uh, EBIT, okay, I'll take that. Most people don't get that one right off the bat. Okay, EBITDA. All right, tell me about that. What EBITDA would we go back and re-look and re at? Exactly. That's good. Most students don't get that right off the bat. I have to leave that to that. So the first thing is going to be the uh, this year or last year's cash flow. So test question, if we underestimated the initial cash flow, we underestimated it, and we revised it upward, what would that happen to the, what would that do to the present value? Increase it. Increase it. What would that do to the net, net present value? Increase it. What would that do to the internal rate of return? <coughs> Increase it. Increase it. Increase it. And what would that do to the break even? It would shorten. So the first year initial cash flow, basically, we would go back and we would re-underwrite it. Okay, what other assumptions or variables in the model would we go back and reevaluate? Plus, when we're underwriting these deals, they usually take about a month. Do you think that there's new data and new information that comes in over that 30-day period? Yeah, we're running these things constantly. So what other variables would we we'd be looking at? Expected rates of return. Yeah, exactly. And which expected rates of return? How many expected rates of return do we have? Two. Two. Which what, what were they? Terminal. Terminal. And the going. Oh no. The going in. Okay. Test question. <clears throat> did we? If we have a negative net present value, did we over or underestimate the expected return? Did we overestimate or underestimate? Too high or too low? Too high or too low? Too high, right? Because as the discount rate goes up, the present value, net present value, internal rate of return go down. So it's inverse relationship. So our expected returns were too high on the terminal and too high on the going in. Okay, got it. So if we can lower those discount rates, we're going to increase the present values and the net present values in the internal. Great. Uh, what other variables? What other variables? Growth rates. Growth rates. Okay. And there was a there was a couple, maybe even a few growth rates here, weren't there? Mm -hmm. Right? Didn't we use a growth rate to calculate the Gordon growth? You know, the initial values and then the terminal values. So again. Last question. Did we over or underestimate the growth rates? Did we over or underestimate the growth rates? Underestimate. We underestimated them. Because as we increase these growth rates, we increase these growth rates, what's going to happen to the present value? If I can increase the growth rate, what happens to the present value? Go up. Goes up. Okay. And what about this one? If I increase this growth rate, what happens to the present value? Up. Okay, so that's one. What else? What other variables do we need to go back and audit? Yes. I'm just wondering how would you increase those findings? You go back and re underwrite. You do more research, maybe marketing research, um, product research, revenue growth path projections and simulations using the S curves or the adoption cycles, you know, adoption curves. Maybe you misestimated, maybe you. You found another couple of case studies that were more perfectly aligned with the company that you were underwriting, and we were using other companies that weren't exactly the same. Now we found some other information and data to be able to justify higher growth rates. You can do that too. Because you're going to be presenting an underwriting package to the investment committee that has all of the back backup information. I'm just going through the valuation methodology, you know, get to you know a decision. Um, but the books are usually pretty thick. 
we have all the backup information. Okay. What other variable? Holding period. Uh, holding period theoretically should not have a significant impact on the uh, present value. So I'm going to assume that away. Okay. One more. What are we missing? Yeah, the pro forma cash flows, exactly. So do you think we underestimated or overestimated the cash flow growth rates? We probably underestimated it. And if we underestimated them and revised them up, what happens to the present value? It goes up. What happens to the net present value? It goes up. What happens to the internal rate of return? It goes up. What happens to the break even? Got it. So it's a game, right? Accounting, econ finance, marketing, ops. You're just learning the rules of the game. Up, down, up, down, up, down. Just memorizing the rules of the game. Okay. And all executives memorize this stuff. Because they all went, did business degrees and they all did uh, MBAs. And actually the private equity and the venture capital individuals, they actually did engineering degrees and computer science degrees and then went and got their MBAs. So they have both. Okay. So we're at kind of a intellectual disadvantage to them. You know, it's really hard to go back and get an engineering degree after you've already graduated. Okay. You, can, you can do engineering and then go do the MBA, but I've never known anybody that's basically done you know, a business degree or an MBA and then went and did an engineering degree. Never heard of anybody do it. Maybe a master's in analytics or something, but never heard anybody go back and do an engineering. So there's a one-way street. Okay. And then we have the pro forma, right? How am I doing on time? How much time? Perfect. Okay, any other factors that we're missing? I think we've hit on all of them. Okay. All right. So we went back and we reevaluated all the assumptions. And we still came up with a negative net present value. Okay. So you have one more iteration that you can go through. Just one more. That's it. You can't go more than past this one. I'm not going to ask you because you're not going to know it. Okay. So the fourth iteration, the last iteration that you can do, is you need to calculate the value of a real call option. Now this is used in real estate development. It is used in high tech acquisitions. It is used in biotech product development. Basically, an augmentation to the investment decision making process. It's an augmentation. It's another piece that was brought in in the 1990s and the 2000s. Because what, what, what they were finding is that companies were rejecting projects based on negative MPVs to only find out that the projects and the acquisitions that they missed actually became successful. So they were rejecting viable acquisitions. And so the academic community came up with an augmentation of the capital budgeting process, which was the addition of the value of the real call option married together with the NPV. Okay. Now, the call options, call options, if you remember, which maybe you don't, I talked to, talk to you about it a little bit. And they don't even talk about call, call options or options in these intro courses until chapter 20. And they don't even include real call options in the capital budgeting decision making process so that you're passing through the curriculum with a big gap in the, in the investment decision making process. Okay. So I had to go back and, and correct it. So these call options are usually three month call options okay, that roll every calendar three months. But real call options are not three month standardized option contacts. They are three-year concepts of valuation, okay? And you have to pay some premium to buy the call options. And what you're doing is you're betting that the value of the, the, value of the firm is going to go up. And this is your acquisition price. 
So as the value of the firm goes up, it pays for the premium, and once the value moves above the acquisition price, you're in the money. This is an in the money call option. Now, our valuations for tech companies highly volatile or predictable or low, low volatility. Tech companies, their valuations, highly volatile. Okay. So usually what you'll see in this approach, the valuations kind of look like this. And then all of a sudden, right? They, can, they scale, they get into the early majority adoption phase, and boom, the revenues just take off, and a lot of times they just go vertical. Okay. So there's basically three, four uh, factors that derive the value of real call options. There's basically three, three main factors. First is management decision. decision making. Now, management is in control of the transaction. They can execute on the transaction right now or they can wait till a more opportune time to take down the transaction. So that ability to wait and create strategic acquisitions, there's value in that. So management decisions have significant value in the contributing to the real call option. The other is time what is called time value. Again, we're not talking about three months here, we're talking about three years. And these are not standardized contracts that trade on an exchange. The person who invented this the methodology, which was Black Scholes, which were two guys that won the Nobel Prize on option pricing, they basically took the three-month option pricing model and expanded it into a three-year option pricing model to be able to come up with the intrinsic valuations for these options to be able to use in the capital budgeting process. It's freaking brilliant. And there's also one called the binomial tree. These are the two. And if you <coughs> do an MBA someplace, or you do a master's in finance or financial engineering, you'll study all and then the last one is valuation or price. Valuation or price volatility. Another significant contributor to the value of the real call option. Okay. So then what you're going to do is you're going to calculate value question is, what does the value of the real call option need to be to get this deal to work? Cranking it out, going to the mathematics, doing the simulation, doing all this crazy you know, science. What is the value? Come up with a, a value of the real call option. What does the value of the real call option need to be to accept this acquisition? So the value of the real call option got to equal the negative NPV. So what does the value of the real call option need to be? So it needs to be 35 million, at least 35 million, right? And what's the net present value? What's the net present value? Net, net present value. If our real call option value is 35 million and the net present value is negative 35 million, 
what's the net net present value? Zero. And if it's zero, do you accept or reject? So the next is, what if the real call option value is greater than the net present value? What's the net net present value? Positive. Positive. Do you accept or reject? Accept. Yeah. Got it. And if the net, the, the value of the real call option is less than the negative net present value, what's the net net present value? Do you accept or reject? Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's it. And if it works, you're in. If it doesn't, that's it. You have to reject the project. But at least you have four iterations that you can go through if you really want the project to see if it's really worth it. This is the, called the due diligence process. This is the underwriting process. This is due diligence. Where you basically verifying and studying the heck out of it to see if it's really worth it because how much are we going to spend on this transaction? Well, what was the acquisition price? 200 million. Yeah, 200 million. Is that a lot of money? Yeah. And 35 million is a lot of money for our investors to lose. And there could be reputational damage too. Go ahead. Do you like, does it usually take all four Most of the, I would say most of the firms will do this, will do this, but they actually do do something like this, but they don't do it in a quantitative approach. They won't do the scientific approach to it. What they'll do is they'll sit around in a room, and they'll be, you know, mostly guys, um, although there's been a few women in, in this space. Um, and they'll say, you know, I've been in this, this business for you know, 25, 35 years, 10 years, 15 years. Even though we still come up with a negative net present value, I think we should go ahead with the transaction because I feel like it's a good deal. Okay? I feel like it's a good deal. Now that's just, that's arbitrary, right? That's not based on science or rules-based investment decision making. That's just arbitrary. And that could become problematic if you have political agents within the firm that are com uh, compensated based on transactions. They really don't care if the deal actually is MPB positive because they're gonna get compensated uh, with the deal. And we're really looking for long-term value, not short-term value. So these companies gotta be viable for quite some time, okay? And there's groupthink involved in those discussions when there's no empirical evidence or no science that backs up the capital budgeting decision making. I would say they do. They do a pretty good job, you know. And because they're dealing with uh, acquisitions of firms that have been vetted, right? But they're they're competitive, right? That's why they pay that much money because it's it's competitive. If they have a really good team that has scientific backgrounds, and then you know really good business backgrounds too, the due diligence and the underwriting process should be able to vet out uh, the bad transactions. And, and if the firm has been around for a long period of time and has some, it can show a track record of good acquisitions, then that just proves you know, that they do a good job in their underwriting. And if they do a good job in being able to select good firms to build value for their uh, investors, more money is gonna come in to the company and they'll just be able to grow you know, over time. Okay, uh, I'm gonna end it there. So if you want to talk about anything or show me anything that's great, uh, let's try to get wrap your head around the evaluation process and we'll do more of this stuff. Is this okay? Yeah. The, uh, the case I wrote in the uh, 